Hey, everybody. Welcome to week 126. So yes, I watched last week's webinar from the beach, and I am so disappointed in my colleague, Adam. You get, Like, dude, it was 125. It's on all of our stuff, and he couldn't remember. I'm like, but he did remember the exact amount of anniversary. It was a baj bajillion. <laughs> I do. In, in our defense, though, I will say that there was a comment that was incorrect. So I was second guessing myself because I knew that was the number because I put it in my LinkedIn send outs as well. But then so there was a confusion in the background in our defense. So just so you know, um, I'm going to go into the chat because Papa Joe has uh, not chimed in here yet because the chat isn't working. <laughs> it's working now. I don't know why <laughs> with an update on Zoom, it automatically defaults to like nobody can chat. Like why? I don't know. Anyway, things are too beyond my ability to comprehend and process. So here's the deal. We're going to be talking about what can you do to prepare for and buttress your company against potential stagflation, which seems somewhat likely i hope it i hope we avoid it but in case it comes it's good for all of us <laughs> to be prepared joe uh, i resemble that remark uh, <laughs> well yeah owned it okay thank you joe you said that uh, you provided the wrong number of webinars so i wasn't going to uh, call them out but okay yes <laughs> fine it's always better to call yourself out People give you grace. <laughs> so, all right, Jack, first of all, you guys know what the drill is. Hit us in the Q&A for questions. We'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and hit us in the chat if you want to harass us or let us know that you're so thankful that the chat is working. So go ahead, Jack. Sure. So um, a quick kind of update on the U.S. unemployment rate. Uh, it comes out on the usually the first week in, into the next month. Uh, I think it comes out tomorrow. It's usually I think on a Friday. Uh, and last month, or current, you know, in the month of August, it was three point five percent. It was down from three point six percent in July, and the anticipated rate is still at three point five percent. So, which is still lower. Um, I had and I overheard an interesting conversation. It was more of a, a shouting match uh, at a stoplight on 45 in Providence, and uh -oh. I had my window down. And uh, it was you know a, a person with a sign, homeless person that was asking for money. And I heard out of the window of the car in front of me, "Get a job. There's plenty of jobs out there." And I'm thinking, okay. And then the the homeless person responded, um, "I'm I'm unhirable." And then so I was like, okay. And then the light turned green, thank mm. goodness. And we all kind of went through the light. Mm. But um, I think that that you know, I hear more of that. And I just have been uh, interestingly um, asking people's opinions about unemployment and about panhandlers and and others that we see in Charlotte at different corners. And and uh, it's okay. Well, it, it seems to me that the majority perspective is that yes there's plenty of jobs out there for people to get um and so i'm just curious if you guys have maybe um informally conducted a poll like that to see if you know or maybe even in the audience uh, if anyone wants to chime in as to you know their thoughts about um unemployment and how it's impacting their business uh and we can talk about that um if there are comments moving uh, forward as far as um stagflation and inflation i'm going to see if i can share my screen for a moment because i found a, a really good uh let's see let's do this let's do this okay can you guys see that chart or not hold on oh wait a minute i gotta hit the share button no. now you should there be able you go to. okay all right now so um you know and and i can yeah and you, I cheated, as you can see, and I will admit to it. I went to Wikipedia, which is not always accurate, but in this instance, it was. So, um, 
stagnation or what is called in, uh, recession inflation. Inflation rate is high, economic growth rate slows, and unemployment re remains steadily high. And so you're like, okay, well, what? That doesn't mean anything to me. So what? What is the difference, right? Um, let's see. All right. So I found this chart. And it kind of gives you a, a quick visual representation of, okay, stag inflation, prices going up, spending going up, economic growth going up, employment coming down, versus in the variables are in spending, um, economic growth, and unemployment. So, and I don't know if you guys agree with that. I mean, I, I, that's my understanding of it. And, it, you know, they're nuances, but just as, you know, 30,000 foot level, that is, I think, the kind of basic definition of what stagflation versus inflation is so um i will leave it at that that's it yeah oh man all right so adam i'll make up stuff more i'll make up more stuff as we go if we need to <laughs> adam what are you seeing from our clients what are they hearing or what are you, what are they saying what are we hearing as far as concerns about potential stagflation um so good question i think that First one that I want to hit on, um, slightly soapboxy, um, to Jack's point about, you know, get a job, you shouldn't be panhandling. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are um, people who generally are panhandling that could get a job. However, um, you know, at, at this unemployment rate, that, you know, Back back during the Bush administration, we called this full employment. <laughs> and the reason that we called it full employment is that there just is a certain percentage of the population that is unemployable. Um, and it's primarily due to disability, um, you know, and you know, and, and a few other, you know, homelessness, <laughs> you know, a few other circumstances that that makes a person unemployable such that you really i mean there's just not much you can do like there's there, there's not like like the maybe we could reduce it another half percent but it can't go much lower than this <laughs> that's why it's called a historic low i mean you can kind of make an eye well how do we get those people employable i mean i'm sure there's programs to get figure out how to get those people employed but just implying that they don't want a job i mean kind of belittles it you know there are just some people that actually cannot um, cannot work, you know, that are kind of left with, you know, and can't, and, and, and maybe could qualify for disability if they actually weren't homeless and had an address to receive a check for. Um, so that, that's, you know, anyway, so box over. <laughs> um, so with respect to stagflation and inflation, I mean, it, you know, I, I, we haven't had any clients that have had their, their, their pricing from suppliers peter out, <laughs> um, yet from what we've seen, and we've started to get, you know, a lot of our clients are still getting some pushback in terms of price increases that they've tried to try to push forward. So they've kind of get gotten it for both ends from that standpoint. Um, I'd also say in terms of, um, you know, recession proofing. The, the thing that I've really heard a little bit about this week is that, you know, generally we haven't had too many clients that have um, seen much of a uh, reduction yet in terms of what, what you would expect to see, like, hey, lower backlog, lower orders coming in, stuff like that. You know, I did hear for the first time yesterday, um, commercial construction, a um, little bit of a slowdown in terms of some of our especially subcontractors who are being asked to bid on stuff and then so that would be an indicator just of people thinking through office demand you know potentially for the future but it's hard to say is that a recession or is that just a forecast of less office demand because i mean we're also i think in charlotte i don't know what the vacancy rate is right now but i suspect we're also at historically low vacancy rates in charlotte still again too um so that was one piece i think the only th other thing that I've heard on the um, recession proofing would also, you know, kind of hits to stagflation and inflation. And hey, I need to figure out how to make up this money somehow. Is that, you know, we've had a few clients that have had customer concentration risk, meaning like, which by definition is 
you know, any, any one customer accounts for greater than about 20, 25% of your overall revenue, you know, customers that have had pretty, clients of ours that have had pretty significant customer concentration risk are suffering more than those that don't um, for, for two reasons. One is they just don't have as much leverage to be able to um, change their pricing because they, they don't have the luxury of, well, geez, if Jack was willing to pay me a dollar, you know, but Gary was willing to pay me two dollars. Jack, if you don't want to pay me a dollar, I'm just going to go find another Gary because there's not another Gary. <laughs> you know, dude, that is true. Kind. Yeah, dude, uh, he is one of a kind. Um, due to customer concentration <laughs> risk, and then also at the same time as especially if they're big, you know, Fortune, you know, 500 type companies, and they're also preparing themselves and starting to look at their own supply chain and how can we start eking out costs. You know, relationships that. Some people, even though they don't see a, a downturn in spending, um, they're not as secure in their relationship as they might have one, once believed that they were. So I think, you know, I think we talked about in a couple of webinars ago, you know, making sure that you feel pretty solid in your customer relationships, not by like, you know, hey, I pour myself a glass of scotch and rationalize that I'm secure. <laughs> I'm, talk, I'm talking like actually getting out there and empirically finding out <laughs> that you're secure by having some specific, direct, possibly awkward and painful conversations um, that you're secure uh, is something that I would be focused on. Can, can I give some free legal advice? Yeah, please. Would that be okay? All right, good. Um, so relation in relationship to kind of re recession proofing your business, what we're seeing is uh, people are becoming a little less patient. I don't want to say impatient because I think that their patience level in um, otherwise enforcing the contra certain contracts to the letter that is in the contracts is decreasing, meaning um, essentially in, in two ways. So uh, landlord tenant relationships, you are entering into a new lease or you're extending the lease. Uh, and this could be, um, a number of reasons, uh, you know, you're moving spaces or whatever it may be. This also comes up in the context of in a franchise or a franchisee relationship where the franchisee, when they are renewing their franchise are required to refresh their uh, building and there's certain requirements in relation to that. In those contracts, it's it's very specific. So you have in a lease, you shall you know you you need to be open during after a certain period of time, and many times you will get tenant improvement allowance or maybe waiver of rent for a certain period of time, and then add on top of that delays, construction delays, material so material delays or, or labor delays that, as I said, there was more patience for that during COVID. And as we're coming out of that, there's not so much. And so uh, a, a drafting, a better drafting of documents is to include those things that include provisions for those um, sometimes eventualities are just going to happen. And providing for delays like that in the contract so that it doesn't it hurt you as the contracting party, whether you're the tenant, you're the franchisee, you are the supplier, you are the recipient of supplies. Um, and, and so <clears throat> there are a couple ways of doing that, depending on which side you're on. Uh, if you are on essentially the pay or side, so you're paying for something, it's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, when I draft contracts for a service provider, kind of say, well, you still have to pay or pay some of it. You can't just not pay because you didn't get your stuff. Doesn't fly very well many times, but the other way around would be is, okay, well, you know, we are required to provide whatever it is, goods and services. And if something happens out of our control, then the delay is excused. Now, some people try to use the force majeure provisions in their documents for that purpose. We've seen how that has been unsuccessful. Uh, during COVID, and I think would be even, even more or less successful. So even less successful that um, in, in this day and age, because of the fact that we know when we have seen the impact of COVID supply chain and everything else. So force majeure is 
really geared towards the unknown, an unknown force that happens that causes a delay, unbeknownst or unexpectedly. And you have categories of stuff, acts of God, riots, war, et cetera, that you just don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, I think that you need to be very careful in drafting those documents if you uh, want to memorialize that it's okay if there is a delay, regardless of what side you're on. And more importantly, what are the consequences of that? Add on top of that, you should have a, an endpoint. So if you say, okay, the, the delay is excused. Well, at some point you got to say, look, I can't hold on any longer. I got to go. Um, even though it's an impossible task, find another Gary um, that isn't going to be as good as Gary. So, uh, you know, it's just the way it has to be. So just, I was thinking about that as we were talking about you know, re recession proofing and things that have evolved over the course of time and things that I'm doing in contracts for our clients to try to protect them from these delays that are no longer seemingly no longer um, excused as easily between the parties. So I think I'm going to launch a quick little poll. I'm just curious from the audience perspective, when we were talking about unemployment and um, kind of where we're at, but before I do, a um, couple comments here. First from Andrew Tucker, not sure where those jobs are, nor what kind of jobs are available. 3.5% unemployment continues to be below what many consider to be full employment. Um, Joe says, great point, Adam, about customer concentration risk. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal, especially uh, something that all companies should be aware of, regardless of what the economy is doing. Amen to that. Um, totally. And one thing that I would encourage you to do, and this is something that I talked with Matt Anderson this morning about, I said, let's keep our eyes and ears open. I'm in a, a group with a guy that launched his company in 2008 and accelerated through 09, et cetera. So that was a pretty tough time to launch. Um, during COVID, he accelerated even further, and, he, and his point is keep looking for opportunities because there are opportunities in down cycles. There are always down cycles, but we have to be aware. But if we just keep sticking to what was working in high growth cycles, we could get you know caught with our pants down. Um, Derek says, how far should we go to ad address stagflation when the root causes are hopefully temporary and definitely out of our control? For example, China's zero COVID response, closing re plants, causing supply chains that have negative impact on economic growth and need for employees, and the effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, inflationary effect on costs, wheat, oil, gas, which affect costs many things. Great comments, and that's actually a, a really good question there too, Derek. So Adam, Jack, you wanna address any of that before I launch uh, a poll? Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I sound like a pessimist, but um, I think that it's funny that the people in charge really believe that they can be in control of anything. <laughs> Um, so my point in saying all that is that I think history has proven out that, you know, all that any politician or economic policymaker can really do is to not make things horribly worse, <laughs> but they have very little ability to make anything better. You know, market forces make things better. You know, my mood makes things makes things better. You know, what you're what you're doing with monetary policy, like it, you know, meaning like, you know, I mean, I know they have models and stuff that kind of prove all this stuff out. And hey, if we pull the blah, 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 and it's like, it's just not it. Every time you hear an article on the subject, you hear, oh well, but this condition's different than the time that we tried it in 1985 <laughs> and then this condition is different than the time we tried it in 1972 it's like there's just not you know there's just not 
there the the there there aren't levers that can truly manipulate my behavior <laughs> but yet that's what they're trying to do so that i that's a long way of saying i agree with you brother <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we should be doing much you know because well, there, it won't work anyway <laughs> but there are things that we can do and first of all we do have control over two things. And I heard this from my swimming coach in high school when I was bemoaning the fact that my neighbor and best friend was blowing past. He meddled at state and I didn't my junior year. And he was a screw off, you know, and I was disciplined. I was doing everything right. And she said, Fry, there are two things that you can control your attitude and your effort. Did you give it your all? Yes. And I gave her my list. She goes, then you have to find solace in that. That is your profound. Attitude and your effort. So there are things that we can do. And there are things that I'm actually going to reference an article that I will post in the chat for y'all from NetSuite. It's actually really good. Um, but I'm going to launch this post or this uh, poll first. So I've just launched... On the hiring front, what is your company's situation? We're still looking for qualified talent. We're cooling our heels on hiring. We're preparing to thin our ranks. We've, we're already laying off people. Please answer. Oh, we got some good participation. Keep rocking and rolling. So, whoo, got a few people, a couple people that are cooling their heels on the talent. Many are still looking. Very interesting. Nobody's already laying off people. It's funny because Matt Anderson and I were talking about this morning. Yeah, um, you know, some of the big corporations are already announcing not only some hiring freezes, but some thinning out of the ranks. And if I remember right, I think Movement Mortgage has done some of that, which I hate because I love Movement Mortgage. But kind of makes sense. I mean, when you were at 2.6 and you're at five or whatever, five and a half percent interest, and it's going to continue going up probably for a while. Kind of get it. Um, so this is interesting. So uh, any last minute people that want to jump in onto this poll, good participation. 80% I'm going to share the results with y'all. Can y'all see it? All right. 80% still looking for qualified talent. Look, and 20% are cool on their heels. So very interesting. Very interesting. All right. So Adam and Jack, let's look at, so there are eight things. I'll tee these eight things up, and then you guys can weigh in where you feel so inclined. But Back to Derek's question, you know, how far should we go? And Adam's response, well, what can we control? Well, we can control two things, attitude and effort. So both are really important too, by the way, because if you think the sky is falling and that the world's coming to an end, your people are going to feel the same way. It doesn't mean that you have to be Pollyanna about it, but, you know, all right, so what can we do? I always look at Apollo 13. Now that was a desperate situation, <laughs> you know, very desperate situation. People's lives were on the line and our employees are, on, you know, their livelihoods are on the line. So I don't take that lightly, but okay. They had oxygen. They were there. They had oxygen to get to there, but they had to get them all the way down to here. What do they do? Figure it out. So you guys that are business owners, you're good at that, MacGyver it. So first thing, I'll, I'll just list off the, the list of eight things, and then you guys can weigh in. First one, improve productivity. Second thing, cut costs. Third thing, evaluate prices. Fourth thing, boost quality. You're going to charge more, you want to deliver more. Fifth thing, fortify the balance sheet. Oh, and boy, can we help you on that. Sixth, tighten up accounts receivables 
and payables. The seventh thing, now I can't help on this one, but become a landlord. Adam's got some strategies on that. And the eighth thing, oh, and I have seen this one, especially in down cycles. Be opportunistic about acquisitions. It helps if you got a little dry powder or you're being creative about what are you going to do during these times? So first question, the first one, improving productivity. Adam, Jack, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah. Um, that's, a, you know, that that's a good one. The, um, you know, on the one hand, oh, sorry. All right. When, when employees hear improved productivity, they hear, oh, you want me to work more hours for the same amount of money, <laughs> which means that you just reduce my hourly rate. And the answer to that is, I mean, not, you know, like, not sound like a jerk, but basically, you're, if you're a Dilbert fan, you're trying <laughs> to reduce the level of Wally. <laughs> that exists in your organization, which is, man, I'm working really hard doing what? I can't tell you. <laughs> you know, so basically, you know, for for those of you who ever been through um, Sandler training, you know, this would be figuring out the ways to reduce the no pay time. <laughs> like what's, what's the amount, like in other words, people accept the fact people probably aren't going to work more hours, you know, instead you're trying to reduce the amount of stupid time you know, that exists while still acknowledging that people still need, you know, a mental health or a mental break from things. People still have to go to the bathroom. They have to have lunch, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you're basically just trying to say, okay, how do we reduce the wasted time in a white, in a white collar situation? That'd be like, look guys, let's be honest. How much you guys really surf on the internet? Could we maybe look that limit that to like 10 minutes an hour, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of, 30 minutes on the hour, um, you know, in a, in a blue collar environment, you know, <clears throat> it, can we, can we eliminate, you know, the 30 minute conversation hanging out while you're pouring a cup of coffee and maybe bring it down to like 10 minutes, <laughs> you know, uh, or you're looking at like setup things you can do to change the setup and stuff like that. So people aren't having to walk as far and all that kind of stuff. So that that's what I feel about with the efficiency and really what's the ultimate way to decide, you know, is a room for improvement or not, you know, at the end of the day, it's, if you, you know, labor versus growth, labor costs versus gross profit, you know, if that, if that ratio has historically been better than it is today, it means that you've got an inefficiency problem. You know, if it, if, it, if it's, if it's historically at its all time high, um, meaning you're more efficient than you were five years ago, meaning you're producing more gro gross profit with less labor, then just set a target. You know, what would it take to get it to be 15% better than it is today? Um, that That's the way that I would analyze efficiency. And, it, you know, you ultimately got to look at it. It's like kind of by each job, <laughs> you know, position that you have. How could you be more efficient in in what you do so that you eliminate, you know, the stupid the stupid stuff. I'll give you an example from BGW World. Um, when we bought, when we bought our Hendersonville um, office. Um, you know, and this great people um, that were just doing what they've been trained to do. Um, a corporate income tax return requires that you report income on maybe twelve lines. <laughs> So when people ask me, well, how much detail do I need in my p &L? My answer is, well, as much will, as makes sense to you as the owner of the company, because I only need it in 12 lines. <laughs> um, this, this firm that we acquired because their former owner so believed in the good qual quality information and decision-making, and you've got to have a great set of books with the ultimate level of detail, was taking a client set of books the client wasn't even looking at and breaking out telephone expenses into landline expenses and cell phone expenses, not at the request of the client, <laughs> but simply to provide more detail. 
that was one of the first things that I said, stop doing that. That's stupid. We're not doing that <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, you know, another thing that they were doing is when Gary went to bring up, bring over his tax, drop off his tax information, he was required to sit down for a 15 minute review of it. I said, stop doing that. I haven't done that since 2007 and haven't had any problems. <laughs> um, why don't you ask Gary if he needed to sit down? So I started asking Gary if he needed to sit down. Lo and behold, you know, they went from everybody got to sit down to only about 5% of the population said, no, I've always thought that sit down was a waste of time. I'll just give you my stuff. I know you'll ask me questions. Like, I don't need to sit there and watch you go through it in front of me. <laughs> um, that, but yet, if I, if I ask them without getting into the details, how, you know, hey, man, can we get more efficient here? Like, what? I just feel like we could be more efficient. They would say, no, <laughs> there's no way. We're already too busy. We need more people. All right. So yeah. here are my thoughts on that. I want to go back for a moment and the comment that Adam made about um, the, uh, you know, what politicians or anyone else can predict uh, had an interesting analogy I heard um, there, and, and some of you may recall that uh, there were these machines that were created um, that you launch a metal ball up around the top of it and it comes down, you push these buttons and they have these little flippers that are called pinball machines. And the analogy was that the, um, you know, as you hit the ball, hit the, the, um, the paddles hit the ball, you make a certain assumption as to what's going to happen its trajectory and then the physics of it which is the action versus reaction depending on the type of bumper and how bumpy it is and which direction it's going to go to um and so many times you can predict that but you may not be able to predict it exactly so the analogy was that all of us do this but politicians in particular when because we're talking about that is that when they debate when they promulgate bills into law, et cetera, they are trying to predict what, well, first of all, from their perspective of what, what has happened and how, what they needs to be fixed and then how they're going to fix it. So they're trying to predict that trajectory. And, you know, a lot of times miss the mark. And so, you know, it is a matter of, and then, and, you know, because of the new trajectory, it goes in a different direction. And then, so it's constantly adjusting. So that's why it's, you know, to answer that question, how far should you go to address it? It really becomes very subjective because you need to analyze how hard you're going to hit that ball, at what point you're going to let the ball come down to the paddle and where you're going to hit it on the paddle kind of thing um, to ex continue extending the analogy. So um, when I, I look at the, you know, these, the list of things you provided, Gary, and we were talking about um, improved productivity. Uh, I think that, well, take a step back from there. I think through the past 18, 24 months, a lot of us business owners have done a lot of these things, these things already. So for example, number two, cut costs. I think that hopefully um, we're at a point where businesses are running pretty lean. And in fact, maybe going in the other direction and splurging a little bit on some things possibly. Maybe not as much because of inflation, but I think that, you know, so cutting costs, some of these other things may have already occurred, but as far as improving productivity, I think there are opportunities there and linking that to the last thing you said, which is be opportunistic um, with, uh, you know, acquisitions. And um, I think that that goes back into kind of the productivity as well. The example for us is over the course of time, well, I'll uh, talk about me. So I used to do timesheets on a piece of paper. I would write the client name. I mean, it was structured. It had boxes and columns and everything else. And, you know, okay, client name, what you did, how much time you spent. And at the end of the day, I'd have the client names, but then I'd have to go back and put what I did and then put the time. Then it was, okay, we have this program that, uh, oh, okay. So someone would have to translate my scribbling and then I would actually have to take time to in, have them give them a lesson in interpreting Jack speak on, on a piece of paper. So for example, a triangle in the legal world means defendant. 
in the chemistry world, it means change, change in temperature, change in whatever. So in my world, it means both. You just have to understand and read it in the context of stuff. So I have to train somebody to, to understand the Jack language. So then he evolved into, oh, well, we have this program where you can do it yourself. I'm like, I'm not doing it myself. That's not my, that's not my job. Okay. Um, but for efficiency purposes, it's like, okay, wow. Now I can actually talk into my phone. It goes into this program. It anticipates a lot of times what I'm going to say um, based upon the, what I've said before. So it's learning, it's artificial intelligence. It gives me the last 10 clients that I've entered for. So um, all these efficiencies for me, but then what happens is my assistant can be doing other stuff. Okay. And so that's how we, in one way we've improved productivity in the office. Now, the second thing is cut costs. Obviously where was an investment in the technology to be able to do that. So you have to think about the long game rather than the short-term because short-term pain, long-term gain in this instance, because we had to invest in that technology, but we will see and have seen a actual net reduction in costs because we have more efficient processes in place. Um, I am not wasting my time uh, when my assistant says, I'm not sure what this word is. It's like, okay, well, you know, I've dictated it. You can probably figure out that it just mis misspelled or misunderstood kind of thing. So it's a long way of saying that I think that um, we, we have, all of us have gone a long way in improving productivity because we've had to, but I think there are things that can be improved and can continue to be improved because of advances in technology and the lowering of costs of that technology. So don't think that, okay, I did as much as I could uh, you know, over the past 24 months, because I think that that is a continual thing that you have to be looking internally to see if there are things that you can, ways you become more productive that, that didn't exist even six months ago. Yeah, the, you know, to kind of get to Bruce's um, question that he's got open here um, about, you know, blue collar hourly employee productivity, um, ergo plumbers, you know, people working longer how hours, but being paid for more hours, <laughs> um, as long as high quality is an objective, you know, to hit on that one, like, again, it, it, you got to still dive into the person, the job, I think, I mean, it, it, eventually, there's a point of diminishing returns, but if I just use as an example, you know, there's, you know, just happened to me literally yesterday. Um, yeah, yeah. There's not enough drywall people out there, drywall labor shortage. Let's just make, say that's a thing. Okay. So what the Boatsman family is currently doing is we're having to repair a ceiling, um, which requires mudding and taping. And um, if you've ever seen someone mud and tape something, um, there's, there's me doing it, which requires a lot of sanding to get a high quality job. And then there's my <laughs> wife doing it, who is an amazing mud and taper and can like not sand, like literally just no sanding required, just paint over that shit. You're ready to go. <laughs> you can kind of guess which one takes more time. <laughs> you, know, so it's like, you know, so, I mean, I, I think, I think what we've seen is that even in the blue collar environment, you know, people just assume that people kind of know what they're doing and do training really around the margins and stuff. Um, where, and, and I'll, you know, an example of that was one of our clients who buy grading, you know, built their own training center. Um, and, and, yeah. and it really was born out of like, you know, a couple different things. But one of the things was they were going out to job sites that got these huge, you know, um, dozers that have to fill the front end buckets with dirt. And they found that people who had, years of experience operating dozers didn't actually know how to fill a bucket to its capacity <laughs> but you multiply that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again you can sort of get to how much time it takes how much diesel cost it takes you know all that stuff just because you know 50 percent of the crew couldn't fill a bucket to capacity you know, they knew how to drive the dozer, knew what they're doing, knew how to do cut, you know, but but didn't know how to fill a bucket to capacity. So that, you know, that's why they opened up their own training center. So they said, I wouldn't take anything for granted on the efficiency piece. Yeah, that's a great point. Hoopa, their training center is amazing. 
But I love the ingenuity that all of us possess if we tap it. It's it's true. We all have it. And if you don't feel like you have it, go down to the front line and, and tap it down there because they get it. So shout out to this book, The 80-20 Principle. Thank you, Adam Boatsman. Thank you for a vacation last week where I could read it and I've got it dog-eared and noted throughout the whole thing. And Adam and I are going to do a little book review because I've got it just I, I've got pages of notes that have hit me. So if anybody has not read this book by Richard Koch, The 80-20 Principle, whoo, and it's not just about business and looking for it is about mindset and it's about things, but it also has application in your personal life too. So shout out to you on that one, Adam. Let's keep rolling into the next couple questions. Any of them strike your fancy? Um, okay. So um, again, I think that, well, when we were talking about, I think the, the ARAP, the balance sheet, cutting costs, and evaluating prices. I mean, we kind of can put all those, I think, in kind of the same kind of general category, which is looking at um, on the receivable side, you know, are, are, you, are you doing a good job in knocking on those doors and finding out what's going on? And for us, it's like, okay, especially, I think there's more of a um, uh, attention to these kind of things as you get into fourth quarter. It's like, okay, wait a minute. We did the work. Someone owes us some money. We're not getting paid. What's going on with that? And it may be that you know you find out that, okay, they there there is this paralysis because of the number. Well, okay, uh, why don't you pay us over the course of time a little bit for the next three months? Oh, I didn't know I could do that. I thought you wanted it all, or you know, you weren't and so um, you know, having those conversations to clean up the ARs, uh, sometimes it, you may have to give a little bit of discount and say, okay, well, you know, we, we did the work, we should get paid for it, but okay, if you pay it within 10 days, we'll take 10% off because we understand that, you know, you, you may be having to continue to have some difficulty coming out of COVID kind of thing. Um, and, and sometimes it's just, okay, take it as the bad debt and just kind of write it off and just clear that stuff out so that it isn't, you know, it, it, it makes, it doesn't make your balance sheet look as bad. On the, the payable side, it's okay. If you need more time, go ask for it. Avoid putting your head in the sand and uh, hoping nobody does come knocking at your door because some, sometimes that knock is an actual lawsuit that now you have to defend and spend money on. And so kind of nip it in the bud and say, all right, you know, what can we do to modify the terms of payment to make this uh, give us a better ability to to pay? And you know, sometimes because that vendor, that service provider, that products provider is probably feeling the same kind of pain on their end, then they may be more sympathetic, empathetic to your request, and would appreciate and appreciates the fact that you're coming to them to have a discussion rather than hoping that they don't get around to, to chatting with you about those, um, those payables or their receivables. So those are kind of my thoughts on the balance sheet type stuff that's on that list. <clears throat> I've got to find it. Um, and maybe next, next week I'll, I'll do it, but um, there's an interesting case study on what happened with Dell computing on cycle times and payables receivables issues they they were about Dell computing was about ready to go bankrupt they were about ready to go lights out because they were growing so fast but it was all the you know we have the inventory we got to have lots of inventory and we take an order and then we got to have all the inventory, put it all together. Then we send it out and then we get paid. <clears throat> they they changed the model and, and turn it upside down to where you 
configure what you want, send us that and send us your money. Thank you very much. And then we build it and we ship it out to you. And the, the, the cycle time for payment was dramatic and it, and it changed, you know, on a dime. And what I would say is look for, and, and Costco is another interesting example where they, they were struggling too because they were so um, capital intensive in building a warehouse and all that kind of stuff. Well, their membership model <laughs> pays for the new building before it's even built now. It, I mean, it's amazing, but they, they had to get creative. They had to look at the pain points. And that's what I would encourage you to do in any of this stuff. And if you feel overwhelmed as the leader, go to your team and let them be part of the Apollo 13 crew figuring it out and make sure they bring duct tape. <laughs> so Here, Here's an interesting, uh, not novel concept, but I think that if, if you're able to do this, having that discussion with your team, but outside of the office in a more kind of social setting, um, I'm not suggesting that you feed them beer and wine to loosen their lips up and that they, you know, and, and then say you can speak freely or anything like that. But it is, you know, kind of pulling away and saying, okay, we're not, it, it just has a different feel. And I say that from experience uh, in doing that recently. Uh, we do it more often during the summer because we have summer associates, but then kind of after that, sometimes it's the partners getting together and having some meetings. I've been more purposeful about that with my, my corporate service line uh, in, in getting people together and just having some discussions. And so you should think about those kind of things as well. But I think communication is key. You, you, you never know when someone is just itching to say something, but they're hesitant. When you give them permission to do that in a respectful manner, then you might be um, shown a blind spot that you may have for whatever reason. You're just not paying attention to it. You are purposely, or you think that something is going properly the way it's supposed to go, but really it's not. But something you know, people are afraid to tell you. So you've created the blind spot um, by not being open to accept suggestions. Yeah, I, I, that's actually mentioned in the 80 20 uh, principle book too, which is just like change it up, change your environment, make sure you take some breaks take care of yourself. Um, you know, I find it's funny when I was in corporate America and had kids in school that I took early and all that kind of stuff. I like many of you, I was like, man, you know, when do I get this workout thing? And, and I'm not a 5 a.m. workout guy, <clears throat> you know, just not when I'm working till 11 o'clock at night. So I would I had an assistant that said, you are going to, we're going to put a code on your calendar and it says meet with Jim, meaning you get your butt to the gym. <laughs> and so three days a week, she would say meet with Jim and that was my lunch. And every day I did that, I came back in the afternoon, I was far more creative I just had a new lease on life. My attitude was far better. And she did that for me because she, it, from a selfish perspective, because evidently I was a little grouchier when I wasn't working out. <laughs> so I think that's really important. Adam and I launched the vault idea. And if you haven't checked out the vault, if you're not, a, if you're a BGW member, you've got to be checking out the vault because it's some of our best thinking there. Uh, we have not done a very good job of mining it and promoting it. So I'll, I'll you know, hold ourselves accountable. But we were, we, Adam says, hey, I've got a, a pontoon boat. We're going to rent. We're going to go moor it into a, a cove, bring the flip chart. So we brought a, an easel and a flip chart onto the pontoon boat. And I still have the flip chart of our brainstorming session for launching the vault because we knew we had. We, we knew we had a lot of great content, but it was just kind of sitting there dormant. 
And, uh, and so we did another one of those. I said, man, we need to do another. And we just drove across the lake to, to so they, he could pick up his wife on the other side of the lake or whatever. I don't remember what it was, but it was fun. It's like we just sometimes just breaking the environment is a good thing. So you, you nailed it there, uh, Jack. I, what I will do for you guys is I will, I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat right now. Um, let's see here so that you guys can see all right i've just put in the article for netsuite the eight things to do and i think i think it'd be worth going deeper on some of those things and what what we can do is we can come back with some more examples of all right so how are people doing that so it's one thing to have a list it's another thing to apply the list and go, okay, how can we, how can we leverage that in our, our environment? So just a thought, maybe we go another week on, on this. Cause I, I think there are rumblings and the feeling is, you know, if trends continue as they have in the past and you never know, but corporate America it starts shedding and doing whatever it's doing, but then it does have a ripple effect down into main street businesses and, and, you know, privately held businesses like what we serve at BGW as well as shoemaker. So anyway, any other questions? So we've had some good comments, good questions. Nobody really harassing us. I'm kind of disappointed about that, but you know, I'll get over it. <laughs> Is anybody doing anything fun for Labor Day weekend? I mean, can you believe it? it's already Labor Day weekend coming up? Where did the summer go? I don't so know. we get we get to go. I get to go sprint to NC State to pick up my daughter. I am very happy to report that we gave her a choice to stay there, come home, and and even bring friends that have families that are far, far enough away that they aren't going to go through the expense of putting them on a plane or putting them on a car or, or driving to get them. So uh, all those offers, and she is actually going to come home. I have to go get her uh, in, in staying till Tuesday morning because she doesn't have class until Tuesday afternoon. So I'm very happy about that so that's so i'm going to do whatever she wants to do all weekend long right on man that's a good move i like that yeah we're just hanging uh we have friday night lights too my son's playing football friday night so that's always fun oh fun mm -hmm. so i will mention one thing this is one thing that we have not done the entire time of covid we're going to do it now this friday Friday Jazz at the Beckler. Oh my goodness. Now the seats are very uncomfortable. I'll just tell you that. They're just folding chairs with about, you know, this much pad. But um it's a it's an intimate venue and the musicians are top shelf, top shelf. And it's not that expensive. I think it's like <laughs> 15 bucks a ticket or something like that. It's not bad. And they have two in in the evenings. I, I don't remember 5.30 or 6 or I don't remember. And, and then there's a later one. Go check them out. And they, they usually sell out. But Jazz at the Beckler, that's, that's the one thing that I know we're doing for Labor Day weekend. So the rest of it, whatever Jennifer wants to do. It'll probably involve planting some things. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah i have i have not seen my to-do list yet either i have a feeling on some things that are on it mostly because they haven't gotten done over the summer so um what and I, i've noticed that the weather in the morning it's not as warm and humid so i i'm my excuse list is getting shorter and shorter this morning it was heavenly i was out on the front porch at like 6 30 this morning and it was i think 63 or 65 something like that it was just whew, it was gorgeous beautiful day oh and so joe 
He is harassing you on the chat. <laughs> How many guys is she bringing back from state? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I guess I should have asked gender. I did not. Um, yeah. See, I'm a, I'm a rookie freshman parent, so I need yeah. all the help I can get. Uh, so, Make sure yeah. the shotgun's loaded. Yeah, I better ask that. Time. Although I will say that in in you know for those of us that are in the electronic age as parents high school with high school kids and college kids i gave her the option of basically disconnecting off of life 360 and she chose not to and i, I promised her i said i'm not gonna you know stalk you and find see that you're out if you want to be late a late at night but the third or fourth night she was there uh i get an alert at like 11 45 p.m that she has 10 percent battery left only 10 percent battery left oh and so i'm like okay having a dilemma and uh -huh. so i texted her and i assured her that i was not uh, that the phone alerted me i was not watching the phone and that charge your battery and i know that you're at your friend's house down the road or your friend's dorm down the road but i'm pretty sure that she has a charger so plug the phone in before you walk after midnight back to your dorm yeah and, uh, she's like yeah and i as she said yes dad and i can see the eyes rolling mm -hmm. but um so uh <laughs> i don't think she'll do that again you know and, and part of it's my fault though because i was one of those parents that with the older generations of the iphones i'm like all right you cannot plug it in, in the middle of the day you're going to mess up your battery and then i have to buy mm -hmm. you a new phone which is totally not true anymore i mean yeah it <laughs> diminishes it but it, you know the old batteries that you you couldn't do that to the rechargeable ones that's yeah. long history but uh somehow it's just it's like ingrained in their brains. And so at least that's their excuse. So, so yeah, Old habits charge your phone hard. often. That's right. Any parting thoughts, Adam, you doing anything fun this weekend? Moving my son to SCAD. So there you go. Oh boy. It's Augusta, right? It's Savannah. No. Savannah, I'm sorry, Savannah. That's what I meant. I was thinking, yes. Right. By the river, it's sort of ish. Funky, funky yeah, place. Right. It's, okay. it's fun. It should be nice and hot. <laughs> I, hope so. I hope so. I like what they've done with the riverfront. Like they, well, there's a Starbucks there. That's how I know and went down to yeah. it. But uh, you see a lot of um, SCAD students with their shirts on, like, um, you know, logos running in, in the mornings. Uh, so it's, yeah, it is really nice down there. Yeah, enjoy. Have a safe trip down there. Enjoy your time with your family, Adam, and same way with you, Jack. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Yes, that is a great school. Top three creative school in the country. At Andrew, thank you, everybody, for being on here. Uh, it's always good to see a lot of friendly names, and we appreciate you being here. And if you have any things anything that you need in the meantime hit us up you can hit me up at gfrey at trustbgw.com i'm happy to help connect you however we can and we'll look forward to having you guys here lord willing next thursday at 11 a.m eastern time good thank, day thank you guys happy yeah. holidays all right see y'all bye-bye